Welcome to this episode of Kears Beyond the Bill podcast. Today, we'll be discussing a really important subject, psychological wellbeing in construction. I'll be joined by my guests, Ros Barrows, the Group Head of Health, Safety and Wellbeing for Kia, John Davis, the CEO of the Australian Constructors Association, and Bill Hill, the CEO of the Lighthouse Club, the construction industry charity. This is an incredibly important and, and serious topic, isn't it? And, you know, I was reading some some statistics in terms of the UK construction sector, which are just absolutely staggering. Um, the construction sector in the UK um, has the highest suicide statistics with two workers taking their own lives every day. Um, and over 20% of work-related absence caused by stress, anxiety or depression. I mean, just to see that and hear that is, uh, yeah... It's it's really difficult to comprehend, John. When you when you hear that, what's what's your reaction? How does what does it make you think and, and feel about our sector? Yeah, it's not good, uh, is it, Louise? And uh, unfortunately, this isn't a thing that's just limited to the UK. Uh, the statistics that we have here in Australia are uh, depressingly similar. Uh, here, we talk about the fact that you're six times more likely to die from suicide in the construction industry in Australia than you are from a workplace incident. And also you're twice as likely in the construction industry to take your own life than any other industry in Australia. Yeah, it's it's so it's, it's a global issue then that's affecting the, the construction industry worldwide rather than just just limited to the UK. Um, and Roz, obviously the stats suggest that, that people in the construction are more affected by psychological ill health. Why do you, why do you think that is? What is it about construction that's, that's perhaps contributing to that? Yeah, I think it's generally one, there isn't the focus, right? If you think about the efforts and energy we put into the safety side of health and safety, yet there's no parity between the health side. There's loneliness in that sector. Generally, you're working away from home. You don't have your usual mechanisms for support. So you might not be near your family or your friends. You might not have your gym or your choir or your church. So... If we think about the parallel of how we all felt during lockdown for COVID, that's the daily feeling for some of these workers that that they just don't have those people near them that they need or the people that they trust that they can talk to. Mm. And and John, you're you're nodding. Do you feel it's is it similar in Australia in terms of the the causes? Do you think, or is it is it different? Yeah, look, absolutely. It it's very similar. We we have a a lot of sort of what we call uh, here fly and fly out. It's bigger distances, so it's it's not driving at sight and staying at sight. It's flying great distances and staying in camps. I think the other sort of issues that we have as an industry, and I, th- I think this is not just limited to, to Australia, this is probably a global issue again, is that it, it's a high risk industry. Um, we're always focused on, on risks and, and that carries a great deal of stress when you're trying to look at and being conscious of those risks. And I think the probably the other big thing is here that unfortunately, and this is where I think our statistics align very well again, is that we're uh, a very male-dominated industry here in Australia. It's only 12% of our workforce are women. And unfortunately, without trying to stereotype too much, men don't, uh, generally speaking, aren't great communicators. And also they, they, they struggle with showing empathy with, with others that are going through difficult times. So you throw all of that together and it's probably no great surprise that we have the issues that we do in our industry. Mm. I mean, it's, it's interesting you say that, isn't it? Because actually, yeah, I'm sure we've all heard um, that assumption, if you like, about, about men not being great communicators and, and being less comfortable with talking about, say, how they're feeling and, and mental health and so on. But actually, when you look at it in terms of construction, it's it sort of plays out in, in cold, hard facts, isn't it? That, you know, this this, this is... This is this is how it's um, manifesting in reality. Is 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 that changing? Is that getting any better, or is is that just a, a huge one of the huge challenges when it comes to addressing this issue in construction that's difficult to to overcome? Roz, what do you think? So, yes, it's changing because we're realising that breaking down stigmas is the first and, and most vital part of improving psychological ill health and well being. So we're 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 getting people to share their stories which is making other people think well that's how i think and feel so i'm not on my own there are other people going through this that i can talk to and if we look at the the partnership care now has with the lighthouse club that's absolutely 
a, a well-being measure that, that's been needed to be taken for a long time because we've focused on office workers and reducing stress, depression and anxiety there. Mm. So, and actually, John, that brings me on to, to the work that you've been doing um, in Australia. So you've, you've read on the, the culture standard. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and um, how it's addressing these issues in Australia? Yeah, sure. Um, I think there's a few issues here. One um, is that um, we we have done a lot of sort of addressing the symptoms and, and it works around, um, I suppose, if you like, uh, uh, first aid for mental health related issues. But we haven't done historically particularly well at addressing the root causes here that we sort of talked about before. And what the culture standard aims to do is really address some of those um, key uh, root causes and and as the name suggests um, it's sort of bundled up around the idea that we really need to improve the, the whole culture of the industry and the culture standard also um, importantly is a top-down approach to doing that this culture standard came out of an initiative called the construction industry leadership forum here in Australia which is industry getting together with a number of different states who are the the uh, in Australia, it's not the uh, federal government that delivers infrastructure, it's the state government. So this body came together and identified there were three key things for a more sustainable industry. One was all about capability and capacity. One was about um, commercial frameworks, improving commercial frameworks. And the final part was the culture piece, improving the culture of the industry. And they set up the Construction Industry Culture Task Force. Same, same people, same members. But crucially, they brought in some academics that, that had a bit of uh, specialist knowledge in this area. And they developed the culture standard. And this has got, again, three key pillars to it, which is about focusing on time for life and, and worker flexibility, um, looking at wellness, employee wellness, so both health and um, sort of physical health and mental health. And then the final component of that is the diversity and inclusion piece. If we can get more women into our industry, then the culture of the industry, I think everyone agrees, will be a lot better. But that's a bit of a chicken and egg situation because the main thing that's stopping women coming into our industry is the poor culture that we have. So the culture standard aims to identify key um, deliverables under all of those three headings that will ultimately form part of procurement. So when a government delivery agency goes to market, as per, there will be a requirement in there that the contractor, the successful contractor, will need to comply with the culture standard. So it will need, for example, to provide flexible working opportunities, look to potentially cap the hours that have worked, will look at health and well-being wellness initiatives, and also look to address things like gender pay gaps within their organisations, but also look to put in diversity and inclusion plans. So it's some really great ambitions there. Um, how, is, how is it playing out in, in reality? Are there some areas which you find you're seeing more success than others? Um, have, you, where, have you seen where it's making a difference in, in any particular area? Well, look, it's early days, Louise, to be quite frank. Um, what we've done now is we've started with five trial projects in New South Wales and Victoria that look at a range of different um, opportunities and, and look at different projects as well. But we're making progress and the, the feedback is really, really positive. But as part of this academic research, we've also got a bunch of econ uh, economists involved to look at and track productivity on those projects. And again, surprise, surprise, the early feedback that we're getting here is that it doesn't take any longer to do the projects. It doesn't cost any more money because our people are more productive. Um, Ros, are we seeing anything on the same scale in, in the UK? Um, are, are we starting to think in that way in the UK about what we can do at a, a sort of macro level to address this? Yeah, so similar but different focuses for the UK where, where I think we would see greater movement forward are where we focus on those causes of psychological ill health outside of the project and support individuals there. So if we think about, um, John talked that generally this is a male dominated environment and boys don't talk. So we need to get to the root of what's causing 
first of all, the anxiety, the stress, the depression that then leads to suicidal thoughts and then ultimately death by suicide. And, and if we focus on that, we've, we've got prevention rather than intervention. John, in terms of Australia and, and, and the priorities in terms of, say, what, what, we, what you might measure and, and what gets looked at statistically, do you see that the sort of those bodily physiological safety is has more of a focus than than say mental health and, and wellness 100 percent. but um one thing that was quite sort of groundbreaking in terms of the culture standard and setting the culture standard up um, or demonstrating the need for the culture standard or the business case i suppose for the culture standard was a piece of academic research that was undertaken here that identified that tried to cost how much um, this problem was costing industry and, and the broader economy. Um, and it was undertaken by um, a reputable group of e economists. And it identified that, on, um, that every single year, this issue of poor mental health um, and suicides is costing the industry and the economy $8 billion a year. So roughly speaking, £4 billion pounds a year. And that is an attempt to start to measure the impact of this, obviously from a dollar and cents perspective. But unfortunately, you know, a lot of the time that's that's what gets the, the, the attention. And it's certainly got the attention here in terms of providing the business case why we need to do something about this. Yeah, that's so interesting, isn't it? Because look, we, we need to address this because it's it's the right thing to do just on a human level. But actually, if you consider the, the importance of the construction industry to the GDP of, of both the Australian and the UK economies, and so therefore the impacts that, 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 this, that these terrible statistics around suicide and, and mental health are having, then, you know, there's a real, really strong business case for, for, for taking action. Um, and in, in Australia, through the culture standard, it, it sounds like certainly at, at an industry level, um, and at that sort of really strategic level, you're, you're coming together to do that. Um, but Ros, are we seeing that same, have, have we gotten hold of this issue in the same way in, in the UK? Or do we need to learn lessons from Australia? Or are we, where are we on that sort of curve? Yeah, if we talk about stats that we're using in the UK, so looking at, at data to show you the impact or effect of psychological ill health, we absolutely have loads of data from all of the services that, that both industry um, and, and care specifically for us you so our, our BUPA, PMI, um, our EAP stats, there's loads of data there that will tell you what your emerging risks are. I think the problem that we have in industry is we're, we're asked to report on or it's expected that we will report on those safety stats, so um, the number of RIDOR reportable in the UK incidents. There's no need to report on psychological stats, so we don't delve if we if we're more creative with that data and, and 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 delve into it to find what we have then we can concentrate on those causes and go back to that idea of prevention i love the term greenwashing for when a company does the, the least that they have to do environmentally but it looks good right um, and i've used that to coin the well-being washing so you'll see a lot of companies and organisations doing well-being washing. So we'll do the, the fruit and yoga approach to well-being rather than actually understanding what your risks are with employee well-being. Yeah. OK, so in, in terms of that, that focus and, and that identification, then are we at a point where we know what we should be focusing on proactively so we can do less of so it's less about the reactive? I think we're at a point of knowing what we need to look for and what we need to look at. And, and now we need to focus in on finding those causes and then introducing um, services that will help support, like the Lighthouse Club. We touched on this at, at the start, John. I, I think you, you touched on this at the start. We know that our sector can, can be physically demanding. Um, is there anything that we need to do at the design, the design and, and contract phase to to mitigate the impact of that, which can obviously then have a, an impact on well-being? Yeah, there is. Absolutely, there is. Whether it's going to happen or not um, is doubtful because it's all about taking the politics out of infrastructure, really, at the end of the day. Why do we have these unrealistic unre deadlines that we're all working to and these unrealistic budgets that, that come up? 
And it's because uh, people are rushing out before we've worked through, properly worked through the job, worked out how, it, how much it's going to really cost and how long it's going to really take. And then all of a sudden, everyone's under the pump from day one, um, trying to meet these unrealistic cost and time outcomes. And you now it, it, it is, I think, in a lot of cases, as simple as that. But I think the other thing, and I, you, you touched upon this before, Louise, actually, you know, it's, I did a post on LinkedIn about this just the other day, um, about how you look at our industry and compare it to other industry. Our industry is a highly complex, highly skilled industry. We solve these, these, these complex problems every day, and yet we, we get a very, very small return on the capital that we put into that. But if we can see ultimately this change in approach with construction because it's impacting on our ability to invest in thing important things like the health and well-being of our workforce the training and the skills of our workforce the productivity of our industry innovation in our industry if we want to see change in all of those areas unfortunately i think we need to really look at how that how our industry operates in all aspects of our industry so, Roz, at our Hinkley Point C site, that's, that's a, obviously a really large site in a rural area with very little infrastructure around it. But actually, we've, we've built lots of facilities to support well-being and wellness into the site. So, you know, I think there are uh, nurses, physio, um, we've got a sort of men's health, um, women's health, all, all sorts of different um, sort of well-being services available on, on this site, I guess, to account for the fact that it is sort of quite an isolated site. So is, is it difficult to replicate that kind of um, focus on, say, a smaller site or a more urban site? Does it have to be one of these big sort of out-of-town sites to be able to do that? It, it does need to be a large construction project or infrastructure project to achieve it on site. But the principles behind that are absolutely possible to, to replicate on any project because in a non-rural locations so let's look at some of our london projects there are loads of opportunities to have those offerings but they don't necessarily need to be part of the site so have a have a partnership with, at tender phase think about having partnerships with a local gym so that there's free access that the company pays for or a local physio or a local counseling service that that people can become affiliated with Okay, so John, Rod, look, this is—it's been a really, really interesting conversation today on what's a, is an incredibly important topic. Um, I'd just like to ask you both if, if there was one sort of really key message, and I know it's—it's it's difficult on, on such an important topic, but if there was one really key message that you wanted to leave our listeners with off the back of the conversation we've had today, what what would it be, John? Can I ask you first? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Louise. Um, I think the one key message here is there's no IP when it comes to safety and there shouldn't be any IP when it comes to mental health. This is an industry wide issue. It's all about sharing what's working well, where we can do things better, which is why I was very keen to be part of this conversation in particular. Um, we need to share that information. We need to get better. Great. And, and the same to you, Roz. Yeah, so my th this is really for well-being strategists out there. When I first started on my well-being career, um, one of my team who became an awesome mentor to me said, if someone were in front of you having a heart attack, you would call for an ambulance. If we keep telling people to direct and signpost towards EAP when someone in front of you is in psychological crisis, then we will never move forward in the industry. Okay, so we're continuing our conversation now on mental health and well-being in the construction industry. Um, and I'm really pleased to be joined today by Bill Hill. And Bill, you're the Chief Executive of the Lighthouse Club. Thanks very much for joining us. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure, Louise. So before we sort of talk about the subjects, can you give us a little bit of background on yourself and how you've, you've sort of gone from working in huge blue chip organisations to the charity sector and, and more specifically um, mental health in construction? All through my corporate career, I've always raised money for charity. Um, no matter what I've been doing, I've always had uh, something I always wanted to give back, um, which was which was uh, worked was really worked for me. Uh, I've always put my body on the line, doing marathons up and down mountains, doing absolutely stupid things uh, to to give back to charity. And 
I was a rugby player as a young man and so I'd always been supporting a charity called The Wooden Spoon which is a children's charity of rugby and then I got myself in a position towards my, uh, my in my career with technology that uh, the company I was with got bought by a big American outfit and it just happened that uh, the role of the CEO of The Wooden Spoon came up at the exact same time uh, which I grabbed it with both hands it was absolutely fantastic and I really enjoyed the sector as well because it was all about you know doing projects for young kids and um, giving them some some fantastic uh, projects and places to, to play and work and it was great fun um, and then the role with the lighthouse construction industry charity came up and I was born and brought up in a lighthouse off the west coast of Scotland my dad was a lighthouse keeper um, <laughs> so I just thought well I've got to go for this um, and I thought genuinely it was about building lighthouses. I thought lighthouse construction. I didn't know they were building lighthouses anymore. But I went along to the interview with my dad's lighthouse cufflinks on. And um, I got the job, I think, on the basis of the cufflinks, to be fair. And uh, here I am. And what I actually, to be what I found was the, the, the sort of the background of construction workers and, and rugby players were very similar in the sense of their psyche about being indestructible and you know just um, having that uh, sort of feeling of just you can't penetrate me um, which was very interesting the psyches are very 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 similar so it was quite easy to segue from the background of what we're doing with the previous charity into this one bit. So, so can you tell us a little bit we we spoke to, to John Davis from the Australian Constructors Association and you know we spoke about it was the absolutely staggering um, statistics about the UK construction industry. How does the Lighthouse Club, um, how is it aiming to help address this really um, important issue? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a massive thing and it, and it really only came to to the fore um, in 2017 when we had the Stevenson Farmer report uh, came out and it said there is a lot of ill health, mental ill health within the industry and the industry started saying, well, what the heck do we, we do about this? And and it was getting then the research behind that to see well, what what kind of kind of problem we've got. But our, our mission statement um, or our vision is in, in the charity is that no construction worker or their family should be alone in a crisis. That's that's our vision. So so what we are trying to do as a charity is to to give a whole surround sound of of opportunities for anybody in the industry to be able to access. Uh, support services to, to get the help and support they need. But we've got some big barriers to overcome in being able to achieve that mission. I think we have got all the services we can possibly have now. I think they are really good and they're very solid and they can take volume. But the big problem we've got in the industry is is twofold. One is, is overcoming the stigma and 87% of the population in construction are men and we are not very good um, about talking about our mental well-being and, and opening up and, and the second thing is is awareness because you know if people aren't aware of where to go to get to help then how the heck can we help them so so those are the two major things that that we've got to overcome um, to, 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 to make the breakthroughs that we need and then secondary to that that that, that might stop or, or help alleviate today's problem but what we also need to do is to go further back and say well how do how do we raise the game here how do we how do we look proactively about how do we change the culture within our industry as well and you know when I, when John was over as well we had a really good conversation because I think they're making some really good breakthroughs down under in, in looking at the culture change piece and and we've got to unite as an industry across the whole piece here and, and also we've got to raise it just above mental ill health as well because it's only part of the your overall well-being is your mental health because it's your physical health and your financial health and your envi environment you work in as well so so we we do need to raise this above and just say this is overall welfare and well-being of the industry and to, to get to that place we need to set some standards across the industry as well. We need the industry to, to work united across this piece and not see welfare and well-being as a, as, a, as a brand or as a unique selling point of your company. It's about a basic standard, a basic humanitarian standard for all of our workforce. We should set a standard um, in there 
to which nobody can fall below or no no sight can fall below. In terms of well-being and welfare then and, and the idea of looking at this as this holistic issue, um, has the industry got its head around, around that? I, I think they have. I, I think uh, the industry is, is definitely seeing this as a, a major challenge to, to resolve. And many of the companies that we're working with have got, you know, the most amazing well-being programs. But, but sometimes there could be short-sightedness in that as well, because in the sense of, oh, yeah, all, all our employees are fine. OK, yeah. But, um, you know, how many employees have got? Oh, we've got 5,000 employees and, you know, we've got a great EAP, an employee assistance program, a great welfare program. Yeah, but hold on. How many, how many people are coming on your sites? Ah, Oh, we've got sixty thousand people coming on our sites. And you go. So what are you do about them? The people, other people are coming on sites. Then the penny drops and goes. Ah, I see where you're coming from now. And and it's about how do we we get that um, all surround sound in a site so that everybody's looked after. Um, and that that's where I think people, some of the companies can be quite myopic. Well, my people are okay, but the other statistic is that fifty three percent of the 3.1 million people that work in construction are either self-employed, agency workers, or on zero-hour contracts. So they've got nowhere to go in their time of need or the time of crisis. And a lot of that workforce makes up the workforce that is on every site in the UK and Ireland. So a very large proportion of these people have got nowhere to turn to. So, so how do we say, okay, for your employees, that's fine. You've got this extra level of we're talking about the base camp and the summit they're they're above base camp but we need to make sure that everybody that comes on site gets that i'm probably lo losing the analogy now but get that base camp support that that safety net support to a, a safety net to which they don't fall below and that that's where we come in as a charity we we deliver that safety net and say okay you will not fall below this but unless we get everybody to know that it's there we can't help everybody but I think the industry is doing some fantastic work in this, this space, some absolutely amazing work um, in this space. And I think they've got it. And I think they've got it. And even in Ireland, they're trialing four day a week now in some companies to see if that has, and they're seeing productivity gains by having four day weeks because people are seeing that as well. I'm going, I'm, work, I'm going to work more productively and manage my time better in those four days so I can have that day off with my family and take some of the pressure off the family, et cetera, being away from home. So there's lots of great things going on. And even even COVID coming along as well had, you know, it was horrendous, but from the construction industry, it had a couple of good things that happened. One is the construction industry for ages saying, we can't do flexible working. Uh, guess what? When COVID came along, we cracked it. Um, and the second thing is the hygiene factors went through the roof. So the hygiene factors on site suddenly went through the roof. What does that do? It makes it a better place for women to work as well. So and we need more women in the industry, desperately need more women in the industry. And again, I see a lot of great initiatives uh, to try and get more women into the industry, which will make this a better place to work as well. So I think we're, we're definitely driving down some correct initiatives and right roads. It's about how to unify it, I think, is our biggest problem is how to how to unify and make it instead of having to, having these moments of brilliance, we turn into to that moment into a whole movement to move the industry forward. I think is is where 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 we really need to make the big push. Yeah, and and so where is the where is the industry in the UK? Do you think um, in in relation to say what 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 they're doing in in Australia? There's obviously been a lot of I know it's early days, but there's been a lot of organisation there. There's a standard. There's a there's a there's a, a a plan, if you like, and a framework for that collaboration piece. Are we anywhere near that in, in the UK? Is that what we need or do we need a different approach here? Um, I, I think we're some ways off it because the, the industry is, is so fragmented in the UK. Um, there's lots of things we need to do. So I, 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 I'm, I'm optimistic about what we can do. Uh, we've got some uh, a new programme that we're trying to unify the industry called Make It Visible. Um, which is trying to, to pull the industry together around um, reactive support, which again is well underway. We've launched a new portal uh, called makeitvisible.info, which is just launched, which is a, a portal that any construction worker can go on now and find information, advice and guidance around emotional support, physical support and financial support. And it gives them information, advice and guidance and also pathways to get support. 
as well. So you've got that all in one portal. So we need to get that message out there. So that's that's reactive support. Proactive support is more difficult, like that's education and how do we get all our black hats to be, you know, um, aware of of mental health issues. How what's the best tools or what's the best education so we can we can still that. How do we work with apprentices to look at the future and the cultural change because that's even longer term change. So the the Make Invisible Task Force is looking at those three elements: the the reactive the proactive and the long-term cultural change. And obviously, you know, well, Kira is, we're working with um, with the, the Lighthouse Club now. What, what do you need from your um, contractor um, partners like Kira? What's, what's, what, can, what can we add? What can organisations like us add to the great initiatives and programmes and so on that, that you're developing to really help drive that impact out on site? Well, obviously, you know, a, a large organisation like here has a large supply chain, and it's that supply chain you rely on to 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 make your projects work. And for me, it's getting that communication that there are, you know, that that whole thing about the services that are available down through those communication channels, down through that supply chain to what I call the boots on the ground, um, where the, the issues are the biggest. And what's lovely about Kia, they're working with us um, on, on an initiative as well with the Make It Visible on site where we, we have a van, <laughs> uh, a multicoloured van um, uh, that's got two tradesmen in it and um, <clears throat> we can put these guys on site. They talk through their story. They, they've, they've had lived experience of mental health issues themselves. They are mental health first aiders as well. Um, they, they talk through their stories. And because they are tradesmen, there's a huge empathy with the people on the ground. And we get back to that conversation of breaking down the stigma and raising awareness. That program does it for me every single time uh, because it gets the people talking and it raises the awareness of the services that are available to, to everyone um, to, to get help and support. And if we can get that program running throughout all of the sites around, around the UK and Ireland, then I think we will make some pretty big, big breakthroughs. But the, the statistics that we have got and what we do know about the scale of, of this problem is it, it, just worth. I think said it at the start. It's just it's just absolutely staggering. So, what is it's sort of there in black and white? I suppose this the scale of, of the problem. So, what do you think it will take then for all of the various industry bodies and, and so on in the UK construction industry to come together? and say, right, we, we need to deal with this as a collective. What's that missing link? Because it's the issue is clear, and yet we, we're we not we're not quite at that, we're not at the level of collaboration that we need to really sort of get to grips with this, I suppose, in, in a strategic way. So what, 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 in your view, would it take to make that happen? Uh, leadership, at the end of the day. Um, it's, it's going to take leadership um, from, from the right areas. And, and, and it's also going to come from the client, because at the end of the day, you know, if the clients aren't dictating in their um, tendering process that the the welfare of the workers that are going to be working on their um, projects are is paramount, then it it, it 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 leaves a gap between what the industry can do for itself because and what the client's dictating. So, so I think apart from getting leadership and unity from the industry and, and there are some great elements of uh, industry bodies that are getting behind this as well which are, is really good to see but we've got to get it from the client end as well where the the major projects that are getting put together um, have actually got more um, uh, descriptive ways of what they are looking for in the way of well-being support for the workforces that come to work on the sites as well rather than you know we want a well-being program that's too too loose you need to have some more you need some standard in here so i think if we can get a standard that we can put to the client and then say you know if you're running a project can you please put this standard in here and, and also be prepared to to pay for that level of kind of well-being that comes through because you will see the benefit of it in productivity so bill have you got any final thoughts or messages that, that you really want to leave our listeners with in relation to this issue yeah i mean i've, I've got what i call my three golden nuggets um that um, if everybody followed we wouldn't be in this problem um for, first of all is from the samaritans always ask twice 
Um, you don't always get the the. the I don't, you often get a different answer if you ask tw the second time around. So, are you okay? Are you sure you're okay? And sometimes you get a different answer uh, the second time. So, always ask twice the first golden nugget. Uh, the second one is uh, seek to understand before you seek to be understood. It's so easy when you just listen to somebody to jump down their throat and say, here's the answer to the problem. And it's also listening non-judgmentally as well. I mean, it's so difficult to do, not to put your own judgment on somebody else's problem, but just having that listening ear and giving them the time to do that. So it's about seek to understand before you seek to be understood. That's from Dr. Stephen Covey, by the way. That's uh, one of his things uh, about leadership. Uh, and the third one is from the Dalai Lama. Um, and you'll just love this, which is, always be kind. There's, there's absolutely no reason to be unkind to, to another human being, especially if you're working in the same environment with them and you're trying to do the same thing as get a project done. So, so be kind. Those are my three little golden nuggets. And if everybody followed those, they're all difficult to follow, but if everybody followed those, I think we'd have a better working environment throughout. Thanks very much to all of our guests for sharing their expertise today. We'll be back next month with a new episode. But in the meantime, don't forget you can hit subscribe on Apple, Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts or find out more at kia.co.uk forward slash podcasts.